where we left off was discussing that um, to compute product of, of two circuits, um, we need you know, we need them to be smooth and compatible. And now the output uh, circuit does find the same properties. Right? So the question where we really left off at the very end is how do you actually compute log of a, a circuit? So if you have a um, circuit that is smooth, decomposable, and also deterministic, um, as, as was brought up earlier, basically when you have a, a log of sum that is deterministic, you can just um, turn that around into sum of logs because only you know, one term in, in the sum will actually evaluate to non-zero. Um, the catch here is that um, to do that, what you're doing is sort of um, using this like indicators to, to make sure that one, only one of the um, uh, term actually evaluates to non-zero for, for any sum node. And in, in the algorithm, what happens is we actually lose determinism. So to compute a, a, or to represent a logarithm of, of a circuit uh, in polynomial time and, and uh, with a polynomial size output circuit, we need determinism. And in the output, we actually lose determinism. The output is only going to be smooth and decomposable, which is important when we think about how we actually want to um, compose these operators. Right? Yeah. So you have the input, only one is non-zero, the other one is zero. But you see the log of zero is minus infinity, so you just ignore them. They are ignored, and you only, so you don't do the sum of the logs, but you just say it's equal to the log of one of them, each of the other. Yes, that's, what, that's where these kind of indicators come in, okay. so that you basically just you know, treat them as, this indicator will tell you this should just value to, to zero, and that's how you ensure that the output is still correct. All right, so, um, so what we did is, is for these uh, operators that I mentioned earlier, sums, products, um, taking power, um, um, natural number, or, or uh, a real number, quotient, lower than uh, exponent, we basically characterize what are, um, what are the properties we need to compute these, um, or to perform these operat uh, operations tractably, um, and then also, yeah, I'll get to that later, and then we also showed um, if we don't have some of these properties, this is actually um, hard. I'll show that to people later. So, so basically, so, 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 uh, can you... oh yeah, yeah, sure. So, so, um, so, so for plus, for instance, it means that you don't need any of the property, or so that yeah. So so plus, this is if you just um, cared about taking some of to circuits without actually uh, imposing any property in the output, right? So you can just trivially in, in okay. introduce a new something. And when you, have a, for when you have a check, it means that you need this condition, exactly. and if you have this condition, they are also valid in the output. So we actually have a separate table that tells you both the input and, and output conditions. Um, yeah, so, so kind of referring to, to that table, what we can do is, is now um, this pipeline view we saw um, earlier, right? So from here, we can say we can see that okay, to to perform integration, we need the circuit to be smooth and decomposable, um, and this circuit S is an output of a, a product operation, which means to perform that product, we need these two circuits to be smooth, decomposable, and also compatible, and keep keep going uh, back, right? So so. Now what we um, know is, is this output here, R, is actually an output of the log operation, um, meaning we need this uh, initial input Q to be also deterministic. And in the table, we also show that when you have some uh, optional like additional properties, they will be uh, um, preserved. So in this case, we, we also need, um, we can say you know, logarithm preserves compatibility. So we, we wanted these two to be compatible. Um, so the, the property we actually need is, is P and Q to also be compatible. Um, so that's how we can kind of derive, um, say if, if you're interested in, in computing the cross entropy, these are the properties you would need on the input circuits. Okay, so I, I suppose I actually forgot to add this like second table I mentioned. Um, we had like similar result here, but instead of um, um, the 
queries. Here we have the, uh, uh, in, the in the paper we have this table um, that for for every uh, operator we were considering, it tells you the um, input conditions you need, and then output properties that's going to be guaranteed once you have those input conditions, and also optionally when you have um, additional properties, which ones will actually be preserved. Um, and, and then you can also refer to the table of you know, when some operate, operator would be um, hard when you don't have a certain property. Um, so for example, actually trying to compute the logarithm without determinism um, is, is actually MP hard. Um, and then from that, we can also derive these tractability conditions for all of these different information theoretic queries exactly just following the pipeline uh, view we, we um, saw earlier with the cross entropy example. So instead of having to look at each of these, uh, each of these queries individually and, and trying to come up with a um, sort of custom ad hoc al algorithm for each, what we can actually do is, is um, use these operators to implement them really, really quickly. Same, same um, of hardness results, you know, when you don't have, for example, like determ determinism, many of these um, divergence queries become hard and so on. Yeah, so basically, um, if once, once you've um, implemented each of these little operators, like quotient logarithm, product, and so on, then um, actually implementing an inference algorithm for any of these um, of information theory to queries becomes very easy. It's just you're you're looking at you know what you're looking at the definition of the query, look, see what the pipeline should look like, and just you know write them out calling to the you know operators we, we defined. Um, so you know, of course we, we you kind of use these information theoretic quantity as as like example to showcase how you can quickly come up with um, tractable algorithms. Um, using this kind of compositional um, operations view. But you can imagine um, you can compose these little operators for, for different kinds of queries. Um, so I want to um, kind of highlight a few examples um, where we, we can actually apply this you know, composition of, of uh, circuit operations idea. A um, few kind of examples of like applications in, in machine learning and also um, comes up in, in kind of causal effect estimation. So um, one example, I think a lot of like, um, like machine learning, deep learning people would be interested in is actually enforcing, some, uh, um, enforcing logical constraints on like outputs of uh, neural network. I think a lot, um, nowadays a lot of people like talk about neuro symbolic learning and reasoning. So I'll kind of just uh, go through these like really quick. Basically, imagine if you have a problem where um, you're trying to, for example, in this case, um, make predictions about, about the um, uh, a path from one point to another, maybe like minimizing a cost. Or, um, so in that case, what, what happens is, is you would kind of break it down into, into a discrete problem where, where you're like predicting each edge at a time for instance. So that doesn't guarantee that the output will actually be a path. Um, so this is like when, when you're trying to make predictions um, and you have some structure about your output. Um, another example could be like when you're doing trying to do um, multi-label classification where, you, where on the labels you, you want some structure to be true. So all of this is kind of detailed, but basically um, the problem is that a lot of new, um, neural network, a lot of deep learning methods just like struggle to actually satisfy these constraints. We also saw an example earlier um, with uh, Gelato and, and kind of the, um, the um, language generation with these uh, logical constraints. So um, really quickly what we could do is, um, do is if um, if you compile kind of the, the con cons constraint you have in the domain as a logical circuit, um, 
what you could do is, is um, so this is your constraint circuit. That's going to be a logical circuit. Um, and then some circuit that, that kind of is connected to a, to a neural network. So this is sort of the, the um, probability distribution that your, you know, your network is, is telling you about the, uh, um, the prediction labels. So what happens is um, because we can perform um, multiplication of, of two circuits given, for example, compatible circuits, um, if you compile logical circuits in, in, in such a, um, in, in, in a way that's actually, um, kind of, that can be compatible with these uh, probabilistic circuit, circuit you have, we can take those products, meaning you're sort of, um, you're kind of restraining your prediction uh, space to just the ones that actually satisfy that logical formula. Um, sparing you a lot of like details of like what actually happens in the product and, and how this gets um, integrated into the training, really, really the um, takeaway is that you can use this uh, trackable product to actually enforce um, enforce logical constraints given by a, 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 a logical circuit um, in, in a way that makes it, you know, like really easy to integrate it into kind of a, a, the whole like deep learning pipeline. Um, so you can, um, for example, train, train them all end to end because you can also differentiate through a circuit. So, so you said the common idea, so you take an existing complicated neural network architecture, you train it. And then from that one, you train a probabilistic circuit that has these nice properties. So you first train this network, then you train another network, and then you have these nice properties. Oh, so, so what happens is actually, it's all getting trained together. So like the idea is that you have a, a logical circuit. You already know um, the constraint that you want to satisfy. So that, that is what's given as a, a background knowledge for, for the domain. So given that constraint, you want to train a neural network in such a way that, that the outputs would, would actually satisfy that constraint. So, um, so, so just how do, how, how do you turn the last state of, uh, of the neural network into something that's going to be so, so what happens is actually, it, you can almost think of it as like a, a circuit that had, or a neural network and then a circuit added at the very last layer. Uh -huh. okay, so, so but to do so it product, takes inputs from the neural network. But to do the product, you need to, I mean, you need to have something that looks like a promising circuit with the right, uh, uh, I mean, with, with the right V3, with the... Uh... Yeah, so, so you, you have a choice of this very last layer, like this last layer um, probabilistic circuit that you're adding. Um, so what happens is like all, everything like, so when you have an input, it all gets like passed through the neural network, and okay, then so, the circuit so, so is so very last yeah, layer. You, you build a new, a new layer, and you train it uh, uh, with inputs, the inputs of the uh, the, the previous layer. Very simple way to say it is: you choose a probabilistic circuit Q that's compatible with your logical constraint. The structure is fixed, and you let the neural network predict its parameters. Yeah, and yeah you sure. train everything yeah, 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 after yeah, yeah. it. Okay. Thanks. So that's one example of, of using this product of, of two circuits. So this way, um, you're actually guaranteed to get um, predictions that are consistent with your logical constraint. Um, another example, so this is kind of very general, right? So uh, um, a very sort of simple pipeline is, is taking kind of a product of, of two circuits and then just computing um, the integration of that output this is just um, computing, you know, expectations, right? So if, um, you know, F is any given function, P is your, your distribution given as a circuit. So this computes the um, expectation of that function according to this distribution. Of course, if, if F um, is given as a circuit or you can turn it into a compatible circuit um, easily, then we can compute this Sort of expected prediction task also um, tractably. Right? So where is this actually useful? Um, 
one example um, that kind of people care about in, in machine learning is when you have um, when you're trying to kind of make predictions and you have partial observations. Right? So of course, for for us, you know, like so far we were talking about like marginals and, and all these different kinds of queries where, where you would have like partial observations, but um, often given any like classification or, or uh, prediction model, they assume that you're given value for all um, all the variables that you've def defined. Um, and often how people kind of handle partial observation in, in that case is kind of guess in in some smart way value for, for each of those like variables with missing values and just run it through whatever class, uh, classifier or regression um, model you have. So what we showed here was um, instead of this way of um, kind of replacing these missing values and then and then running them through um, your prediction model, we could actually talk about okay, what is the expected output of this classifier or, or regression model with respect to some distribution over all the all the features? Right. So we're saying we have some partial observations. Um, if you were to consider all the completions of, of those um, missing variables and, and consider the output of your prediction model um, with respect to the, you know, how, how, those, um, how those partial, uh, what, what the probability of those partial assignments are, what is the actual expected value I would see? Um, so this we can um, compute you know, tractably in, in some simple cases of, of classifiers and, and regression models. Um, you can also kind of use that um, result to, to kind of you know, define functions that can be represented as uh, circuits. So some kind of generalization of like decision trees or, or simplest um, sort of linear regression. That's a, a circuit version of it. Um, so in those cases, we can compute this exactly and, and actually um, you know, get, get really kind of good uh, missing value predictions. Um, one, one last thing um, kind of uh, talk a lot about in, in like machine learning is also like, are, are these models biased? Are these models fair? Some kind of simplest notion of, of fairness that people have uh, defined essentially turns into like an expectation um, problem, you know, e comparing like expected value for different dem demographic groups, which you can also uh, compute easily um, with, with circuits. Right? So one um, last example that I, I kind of want to focus on more is actually um, estimating causal effects. So in this case, suppose we have, um, so Variables, uh, variable set X, and given some sub subsets, we're interested in, in um, what the causal effect of, um, what, so what, what the probability of, of Y will be if you intervene on um, variables A. So here, here Y and A are disjoint sets of variables. So of course, in, in general, um, correlation is, is not causation, so this is not the same as the conditional probabilities um, we saw so far. So in um, sort of causal inference, this is what you would have is, is kind of if you're given um, some kind of assumptions or, or some uh, knowledge of, of your causal structure, then that tells you, kind of, um, how, um, that gives you formulas to, kind of, um, to actually estimate this, this to, yeah, um, estimate this uh, effect after this two operator. Operation. So in this case, for instance, um, in this example, that's that's called a, a backdoor. Um, so the, the backdoor formula for for this structure is is given here. So this is an example where you have some confounder variable um, as as well as uh, an effect from this um, from from A to the outcome Y, um, and then also another example um, with Again, the, the formula given for, for this uh, causal effect. And if you look at this, now um, this kind of gets um, composed into, you know, taking like 
conditional distribution of, of your distribution or the concrete marginals, and then you know, summing them over, taking quotient, and so on. So you could imagine some of these might, might, might reuse um, the like operators we defined earlier, right? Taking products, uh, taking, taking quotient of some two circuits or, or functions. Um, so, kind of going into a little bit more detail. So, considering this um, backdoor query we saw earlier, I um, think that Benji is over here. So, also feel free to like jump in if I'm missing any detail or if I'm like mis, mis um, explaining it. But, um, so, if, <coughs> if this distribution P is given as a circuit that's not just um, it's not just tractable for you know um, marginals and map, but it's actually even structurally decomposable for some unspecified V tree. This query is still um, sharply hard to compute. Right? So how do we actually um, handle this kind of uh, causal inference? Well, we're going to um, use this idea of compositional uh, operations. And then think about what are the properties we need for these like input and outputs to to this uh, operation. So um, here here's the the pipeline for the um, backdoor query. Um, so for instance, what, what gets involved is is this uh, marginalization as an operator. So now now instead of computing a, a marginal. Um, probability for some particular partial uh, instance. Now what we're doing, doing is actually um, trying to get another circuit that represents a marginal distribution over some subset of variables, right? So this is kind of um, um, analogous to like forgetting in, in uh, logical circuits, if you're familiar. Um, and then the product with have seen the four same marginal um, operator. And here this, uh, conditional is actually also another you know, pipeline using the, the operators we've, we've seen so far. Right? So the main um, sort of the, the new uh, operator here is actually doing this marginalization and what's the property um, you get and, and you need for the input and outputs here. Yeah, so, so the issue here is that you need to for the power operation. Um, and, you know, as sort of was in the atlas, but um, if you apply marginalization to a deterministic circuit, the output is no longer necessarily deterministic. So if you see on, on this left side, you have to go through a marginalization operation and then a power. Um, and so, yeah, so, so on the next slide, on the sort of property you need. So, we don't quite hear you. Oh yeah, so, to, oh, so I, I can I can uh, repeat it. So basically, we we um, have this power uh, really like an inverse operator, and referring back to the, the atlas the composition of, of operations um, table for, to compute this uh, inverse of a circuit, we need the input to this in, um, to be deterministic. Well, what is the input to this um, operator? Well, the output of marginalization of a uh, circuit P, right? So the, the problem here is even if this initial circuit P is deterministic, um, after mar marginalization, um, the, the output might no longer be deterministic. So now we, we need a, a way to somehow express it and guarantee that after marginalization, you can feed it into the power operator, meaning we, we want some property about this initial circuit that would guarantee us uh, determinism after marginalization. And um, in an obvious way, uh, the property is called marginal determinism, meaning essentially meaning if you look at a, 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 um, a subset of, of variables, the so yeah, so it, it's kind of defined um, in terms of the, the initial circuit and the um, 
partial assignments that you can feed into a circuit. But one way to essentially think about this is that once you've um, marginalized out all the variables so that you only have um, only have Q left, the resulting circuit is um, deterministic. So that, that's a way to think about um, marginal determinism or, or Q determinism uh, particularly. Kind of, um, yeah, so this is essentially just kind of um, coming from coming straight from the, the definition, right? So, so we've defined in, in such a way that if once you marginalize out all the variables but Q, then the resulting circuit is uh, deterministic if you started out with a Q deterministic circuit. So basically, um, going back to this picture, one second. So, so now we, we kind of have a language to express um, what what properties we need for this um, initial circuit, basically coming from uh, marginal determinism with respect to particular subsets of uh, variables. Okay. And then you can kind of do the same same exercise of, of starting from what you need at the very uh, last output, going through your pipeline in backwards order to def um, to, to come up with what the input conditions are for your um, initial circuit. So, and then given, given um, this marginal determinism property, we can actually compute this backdoor query in, in uh, polynomial time. Okay, and then here are some um, open questions that, that Benji has kindly sort of, uh, suggested, right? So. Um, yeah, so, so one example is, are, are all of these um, positive queries um, actually tractable? Uh, um, yeah. for, for some circuit uh, property that we can define. So, and what, yeah. yeah, so like we saw the back door and then we also saw the uh, uh, napkin um, sort of example of a formula, right? So actually, um, both of these you can do in, in polynomial time, but yeah, there are some other other sort of queries, other graphs which might lead to to other uh, expressions which I don't know about the other Yeah, and, and basically like um yeah, what's the what's the you know, optimal complexity for, for the, these things? different kinds of queries. Um, okay, so, so hopefully um, that gives you a picture of, of some more exciting queries that, that we can uh, compute efficiently and, and um, what conditions we need for that and, and how to derive those conditions. Um, and next, Guy will talk to you about um, the question that was hinted at very, in the very beginning are all tractable distributions actually, you know, probabilistic circuits or can be represented as circuits? All right. Um. All right. Um, okay. Um, all right. So I know we've covered a lot of ground and it's been a long day, but I, I tried to save this really, really neat, fun thing for last. I really enjoyed this myself. Um, and also, I saved it for last because now that you're all sold on probabilistic circuits being the end-all be-all of probabilistic reasoning, <coughs> I'll show you that they cannot do everything and we need more and whatever. And there will be some interesting connections to uh, circuit lower bounds, uh, probability theory. And so, uh, you know, I, I hope this is a, a, a fun way to end. And then you can look in la later in the slides, look up all the machine learning details. Uh, before I get into the fun stuff, I have some uh, basic bookkeeping, which is I promise to tell you that there's, you know, all of these other models historically that uh, we all just call probabilistic circuits uh, as an umbrella term. And I do owe you a little bit of a more uh, a thorough overview there. So this might be a bit boring at this point, but I do want to kind of give credit to all this original work that proposed some new circuit language in some syntax with properties like decomposability and so on in order to uh, do probabilistic inference. So arithmetic circuits are very well known, some product networks, which are 
uh, more focusing on the learning side. But there's a whole bunch of other ones. And uh, if you ever wonder, uh, you know, what are these things? And I don't really want to dive into all the details and figure it out myself. So here's an overview of, uh, you know, saying a sum product network is a smooth and decomposable probabilistic circuit, but it's usually not deterministic. When you see an arithmetic circuit in the literature, it's always deterministic because it's been compiled as such. And so here you can figure out also that a bunch of other representations in the literature actually have this structure decomposability property that allows you to then compute things like KL divergence, entropy, and so on. Okay, So this is here mostly to uh, give credit to all of the original proposals. And uh, here on these slides later, you can figure out, well, if I have a graphical model, then um, it has these properties. And then by now, you know exactly what query classes are tractable. Um, you can do this for graphical models. Arithmetic circuits, they're really very similar to the probabilistic circuit syntax we showed before, except the parameters are given as separate inputs. They're not given on the edges. Uh, some product networks syntactically look identical to what we showed you. Uh, uh, so they were one of the later proposals in this family. Uh, cut set networks look very different, but they end up kind of being like BDDs followed by tree-shaped graphical models. By now, it should be clear that these are just probabilistic circuits. And there's a few other things like uh, probabilistic sentential decision diagrams, probabilistic decision graphs, and or graphs. Um, and so, you know, credits to all of that original work. Um, but now the, the final question that I'm kind of excited about as a fun theoretical exercise is, um, well, OK, probabilistic circuits, somehow they cover all of this stuff that we know how to compute tractable marginals in. So I'll focus on marginal probabilities for now. right? All of the stuff with low tree width, all of the other representations with model counting on circuits, it's all, is it everything? Are there distributions that we actually know uh, how to compute marginal probabilities for that somehow do not have a probabilistic circuit representation, okay? Uh, or is this like the universal language of all things tractable for marginals? And so this question was uh, um, occupying me for a while. And specifically, I always had this uh, counter example in mind, which is called the determinantal point process. It's quite popular in theory, uh, probability theory, but it's also quite popular in machine learning as a model of, uh, for example, you know, baskets of Amazon shopping. Uh, you know, this is typically how you model distributions over you know, people's behavior where, um, well, like, I'll get to this in, in a second, but essentially the way that they're defined is you're given some matrix which is called an L ensemble. And if I would like to know the probability of a particular world, for example, a world where one, uh, X1 is set to one, X3 is set to one, and everything else is set to zero, then I just take the first and the third row and column. I get the sub matrix and I compute its determinants. Okay. This determinant up to a normalizing constant gives me exactly the probability of this world, the likelihood. So this tells you how to compute a likelihood, the probability of a complete assignment. But there's actually some really neat math that will tell you how to turn this L ensemble with some efficient linear algebra into another matrix where you can now compute marginal probabilities, okay? And so this is actually a distribution that is tractable for computing marginals. But the way that you compute the marginals is by computing determinants, okay? Um, the reason why we care is, um, well, they're tractable models, just a bunch of determinants. Uh, they have this nice property called global negative dependence. So as I make more variables be true, it becomes less likely that the other variables are true, okay? And so this is very intuitive. If you think of shopping, right? If you buy a, a, a screen for your computer, it's very likely you'll buy a second screen and even most likely you'll buy a third one, right? So there's kind of this negative dependence that prefers kind of sparse sets as solutions. Uh, and yeah, so these have applications in recommendation systems. Um, and so the, the question we had a couple of years ago was, um, well, okay, we have this gigantic language of probabilistic circuits that are decomposable. It includes all uh, bounded tree with graphical models. And then we have these DPPs and we don't really know how they fit in this picture, okay? Um, well, we already know that there are certain distributions that are both efficiently represented as circuits and as DPPs, the trivial ones, just, an independent coin flip for every item. It's essentially uh, an L ensemble that's a diagonal matrix where you, if you compute a determinant, you just multiply the diagonal elements. Okay, so that's easy. The real question is, is there something here? 
is there a, a, de a determinantal point process distribution that is tractable, yet it doesn't have a probabilistic circuit, okay? Um, and uh, we tried to prove this for various types of probabilistic circuits, and I'll spare you some of the less interesting theorems, but essentially, if you have a bunch of properties like structure determinism, um, deco um, structure decomposability, a determinism, etc., it's very easy to prove that you cannot write a DPP, determinant form process, in, as a probabilistic circuit. Um, the interesting result here is that if you have somehow the most general language I showed you that still supports marginals, meaning um, probabilistic circuits with you know, positive parameters for the mixtures, and only decomposability, then somehow uh, you can prove that actually uh, there does not exist a determinantal point process uh, representation in this language. Um, I want to mention an open problem, which you might want to think about, but it's probably too difficult, uh, which is if you allow negative mixtures where you say, I, I create a mixture model with some probability of five and another one of minus four, Right. If you allow for negative probabilities on the edges of your probabilistic circuit, then we don't actually know if it can represent DPPs. And so this is something you might think about. Yeah. So is the uh, conjecture that totally similar to uh, one of the determinants where dominant is basically, you know, if you see a world which is sharply hard, the dominant is easy, but you have to exploit You have to, and it's also related to inclusion exclusion and uh, the whole question of Q9, QW, it's all related, but yeah, maybe it will be more clear uh, at the end. Um, yeah. Okay, so how do we prove this? Well, we don't really prove this. This was uh, actually a result that kind of fell out of originally the uh, arithmetic circuit lower bound literature, so work by Raz and uh, Yehudayov, uh, where essentially they prove there exists what's called a multilinear arithmetic circuit. I think it's also called monotone that uh, cannot represent uh, certain functions, including uh, the uniform distribution over spanning trees. And so it turns out that the uniform distribution over spanning trees, so, so what is this? This is, you have a, a, a Boolean variable for every edge in, let's say, the complete graph, and you would like to have that there's a probability of zero for all uh, choices of assignments to such variables, except for the ones that correspond to a spanning tree in the graph, okay? Um, and let's say that we want a uniform distribution over those non-zero things, right? Uh, so it turns out that, yeah, this distribution actually is a determinantal point process, so it's tractable. However, uh, folks have shown that uh, any decomposable probabilistic circuit representation has to have a size of at least 2 to the n over 30,000, okay? So uh, this is a, you know, a rare event where we have an unconditional lower bound, and it directly applies to this question. Like Dan is going to ask something. No. Okay. Um, all right. So that's exciting. Um, and uh, we now know that, yes, yeah, spanning tree distributions are not representable by the PCs I've shown you, and they are DPPs. Okay. Uh, so let's fix this. Let's come up with a one circuit language to rule them all. Let's come up with one representation that can represent all tractable distributions, okay? I don't wanna have the language be probabilistic circuits, union, DPPs. That's not very pretty, right? I would like to have one representation of everything. Uh, and so this is what we will call a probabilistic uh, generating circuit. Um, okay, so this is all inspired by the notion of a generating function, a probability generating function, which is a very well-known thing in probability theory. And I'm sure many, theoreticians in this room have used uh, generating functions as a ways of proving properties about distributions. Uh, the only thing that we will do that's interesting here is say, this is not just a mathematical object to prove a theorem. This is actually a data structure that we will use to represent things in a computer and compute probabilities. Okay, that's the only leap we make here. And so here's the idea. Um, so a generating function represents a distribution by, uh, so by the way, everything is binary here. Uh, right, it's convenient. Um, the way that it does so is by associating a monomial with every possible world. And the monomial has all of the Z variables that are set to true in that particular world. So here, all variables are set to true. It has probability 0.16. So this monomial, Z1, Z2, Z3, has a, a, a coefficient of 0.16, okay? The world where everything's false has probability uh, 2%, okay? Um, 
Now, what's really neat here is, um, you know, typically when you think of generating functions, you think of them as these multilinear functions, but you can also uh, just factorize them. And this is an equivalent way of writing uh, this particular generating function. Of course, you see where I'm going. Uh, what I would like to do is write these things as circuits, okay? I would like to write them as circuits that are sums of products of sums of products of these variables, z, indicating which world am I in, and uh, some constants uh, that somehow define what are the coefficients of these monomials. So this circuit here is just identical to my original uh, multilinear function. It's just a different way of writing it. Okay. Now, uh, there is a purpose to all of this. Oh, I, I should also mention, if I would like to take a probabilistic circuit and turn it into a generating function, it's quite easy to do so. Uh, so a probabilistic circuit over Boolean random variables, you can also think of it as being this type of uh, a multilinear function where you have these leaf or these input distributions saying x is true, uh, x1 is true, x2 is true, x3 is true, or x1 is two, true, x2 is true, x3 is false, right? So this is kind of telling you what is the what are the literals that are represented by my probabilistic circuits, okay? And then you have all of the coefficients, which are all of the parameters on the, on the sum nodes that get arithmetically combined together. And um, if I need to turn this type of function into a generating function, it's pretty easy. I just need to take all of the positive literals and turn them into these z variables. And I have to take all the negative literals and turn them into the number one, okay? And that means that I can take a probabilistic circuit with 500 million edges, and I just replace all x1 by z1, all not x1 by 1, and now I have a, a probability generating circuit, a probabilistic generating circuit that looks like this, okay? All right, so I know how to get hold of these things for any probabilistic circuit, uh, but the whole point of this exercise is I would like to be able to compute marginals efficiently, okay? Uh, and I would like to compute uh, likelihoods. So if I somehow get hold of this generating function as a circuit, how do I compute a marginal, right? Our previous algorithm no longer applies because it's a different kind of function, right? It only has these z variables. It doesn't have these input distributions anymore, right? Uh, well, so here's a very cute way of computing a probability. So suppose I care about uh, computing a marginal probability where a bunch of variables x are set to true bunch of other variables x are set to false, and all the other variables are unknown. I marginalize them out of the distribution, okay? So what I can do is um, for every x that is required to be true, replace it by some purely symbolic variable t, okay? Every x is that's set to false, I replace by zero, and all of the other uh, variables z, I replace by the constant one, okay? Now I can evaluate my circuit, and I end up just taking sums and products of polynomials in T, all right? At the output of my circuit, I get some polynomial in T, agreed? And so now here's how you decode this polynomial into a marginal probability. All of the monomials where I set variables to true that must be false by my query, they all get multiplied by zero. They are removed from my equation. Okay, so those monomials disappear from the, the expression. All of the other monomials, they all get added up to become this polynomial in T. Now, only the monomials that set all of the required variables to true, they will have the maximum degree. The one that set everything to true, that needs to be set to true. All the other ones, they will miss some of the variables that are required to be true in my query. If you sum all of those up, the coefficient here, this is my marginal probability of that query, okay? Let me give you an example. Okay, so bottom line is the, the leading coefficient here of this polynomial in T will give me exactly the marginal probability that I would like to query. Here's an example. I would like to know what's the probability that X2 is true and X3 is false, marginalizing out X1. Uh, I set C3 uh, to zero. Um, I said Z1 to 1, Z2 to T, okay? I compute my polynomial and I get 
0.16t plus 0.02. I don't really care about the 0.02. What I care about is the 0.16 because this is exactly the probability I'm looking for. It's this marginal probability summing these two uh, world's probabilities. So what we have here is a completely different circuit language. It's not a probabilistic circuit in the sense that I defined it earlier, but it's also a tractable language for marginalization. I can, in polynomial time, get any marginal out of this distribution. All right. Um, so the algorithm I just described to you has this complexity. You need to multiply and add a bunch of polynomials, which has this complexity. Uh, it's all polynomial, um, maybe, should I, should I give more details? Yeah, so, so this is the, for m edges and n random variables. Um, so we need to compute this. Uh, we have to propagate essentially these n degree polynomials through our circuit, um, which has this complexity if you do it naively. And here you just use the Fourier transform to multiply the, um, the polynomials. Uh, so that's efficient, but you can actually do better. So there was actually a paper that just came out last month where people showed that um, there's a simpler way to do this. You just reevaluate your circuit n times with different values for t, and you uh, compute the polynomial interpolation to get this m times n complexity to compute a marginal probability. Yes. Nicer. <laughs> okay. Um, good. So this is nice. Uh, th these probabilistic generating circuits, they're tractable, uh, but there's a caveat, which is, well, okay, there's kind of a positive and a negative interpretation of this. I haven't mentioned anything about decomposability or syntactic multilinearity or any other properties because there are no properties. This circuit has no local thing that is required to be true for you to compute a marginal. Any circuit that represents a generating polynomial will be tractable no matter how you represent it, okay? So that's nice. You don't really have to worry about these local syntactic properties. The downside is if I give you a circuit Actually, checking that it represents a multilinear function now becomes hard, in fact, NP-hard. Uh, so you kind of have this global property of the function that's hard to know. So you have to somehow trust it by construction. Whatever circuit I give you is actually representing a uh, generating polynomial. Um, okay, so back to our problem of determinantal point processes. Because generating functions are so well studied in theory, we know exactly what is the generating polynomial for a determinantal point process. It's this one here. Um, so this is the expression. It's telling you build a, a diagonal matrix of these Z variables that are part of my polynomial, uh, multiply by this L ensemble, this matrix of parameters, uh, add I, determinant, da, 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 da. okay. Um, so now we have to take this expression, which is just a mathematical expression, and turn it into a circuit that is efficient in the number of random variables, a compact circuit, okay? Um, so this is how you do it. First part is easy. This is just a constant that does not depend on Z. So you just pre-compute it. This is just a number. And then uh, we need to somehow get hold of a circuit representation of this determinant computation that only uses sums and products because that's how we defined the circuit language. And uh, in the literature, again, you can find some really nice uh, division-free determinant algorithms uh, Samuelson Berkowitz is one choice you can make. And now you can actually get hold of a circuit representation of your determinantal point process in polynomial time and with obviously polynomial size. Um, so this is neat. Now we have a language that captures all probabilistic circuits, all determinantal point processes. Um, if you actually do this from a machine learning perspective, it also you can also train these models from data and actually get state-of-the-art likelihoods on some of these benchmarks. Question? Yeah. So they, it's, a, it's a bit artificial the way probabilistic circuits are encoded into Z. What do you mean with artificial? Uh, I mean, you cannot do the same kind of thing that you were doing on PCs on PGCs. You can, right? You, the possibility, the, uh, you, you, can, you can still do uh, all of this with this new representation. So this um, PGCs are in general not decomposable. They're just any circuit. But they also still allow you to compute a marginal. That's the beauty of it. Yeah, but uh, if you want to do other things than like all oh, the other things. No one has even thought about computing other queries on, on these things. So, so it's just, it just a way yeah. to uh, have a, a common way to compute marginal and that's all. That's right. It. So what is the, the simplest language that captures all tractable processing models? Well, okay. 
this is at least a proposal that captures both of these things in a, in a very simple circuit language. Yeah. Um, you, you can still have like decomposable. Yeah. Right? I think the same UI paper showed that like module is actually faster. Yeah, that's a good point. If you do this translation, this happens to be decomposable, even though there's no reason why it has to be, and that actually speeds up your evaluation from n times n to just n, I think. Yeah. But but yeah. you could just take the original PC and do oh, the yeah, there's, module. Uh, there's nothing to be gained here, yeah. but what you would like is to be able to express distributions that you couldn't express as a process. Yeah. So this is just showing that it subsumes PCs. Okay. Um, I feel like we're pretty tired at this point, so let me just hand wave through the next part, and then I think we're done. Um, so the reason why people study uh, generating polynomials is to prove theorems about distributions. For example, um, people like to prove properties such as distributions being uh, strongly Rayleigh. Uh, you'll find a lot of interesting theory literature on that. And so this really means that the... the that the complex roots have this constraint that they cannot have a, a positive imaginary part. And so you wonder why is this interesting? Well, it happens to be true of these DPPs. Um, and it kind of implies that whenever we have this specific property, that you can actually sample efficiently from the distribution. If you build a, a Gibbs sampler of a certain type, it's provably in polynomial, polynomial time going to uh, converge to the stationary distribution. So what this property tells you is, you know, if this polynomial has certain types of roots, then it's sufficient to sample from, okay? And sampling is, of course, an approximate inference algorithm, but, you know, this is why people care about these representations because now you can build provably efficient samplers. Um, here's a statement of the sampling theorem, which we'll skip. So a natural next question is, well, we have uh, PGCs, they allow for exact marginals to be computed efficiently. We have strongly Rayleigh distributions, which allow for sampling to be done efficiently. DPPs are in the middle. And so are there generating circuits that are efficient for um, uh, computing marginals, but don't have this strongly Rayleigh property? And are there distributions that are efficient to sample from that are intractable for computing marginals? Okay, And so... Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> this is a trivial generating polynomial where the roots are, you know, i and i, and so therefore it's not strongly Rayleigh yet. It's a very small probabilistic generating function, and it can be used to compute marginals efficiently. So that's a very simple counterexample. Uh, this counterexample is, uh, or separating example, or whatever you want to call it, is a bit trickier. So you can check this paper from last month. Um, actually encoding some very general form of a relaxation of bipartite matching into a generating polynomial. Um, I'll spare you the details, but essentially uh, what they're able to show here is that, yeah, there is a generating polynomial that has this property that it's real stable, meaning it has this strongly really efficient sampling property. Um, and that's also sharply hard to actually uh, exactly evaluate marginals in. And so this is a counterexample. There's some very interesting details in this proof, like it's somewhat non-trivial uh, because you have to make sure that this polynomial represents a distribution, so no negative coefficients and so on, uh, but you can check the work later. And so here's the statement of the theorem. So if p to the sharp p is not in p slash poly, then this particular generating uh, polynomial has no PGC. That's compact. All right, so then uh, this is the picture we're left with. And I mean, this is all very recent work in the last, I mean, the PGCs were only proposed two years ago and all of the other follow-up work is from this summer. So um, I think there's a lot to be done for people that like generating functions and polynomials to understand really the landscape here. And at least today, I'm not aware of any distribution over binary random variables that is efficient to compute marginals in that does not have a uh, small uh, probabilistic generating circuit. And so maybe someone can tell me one or prove that this is the universal language of all tractable distributions. Um, and, uh, that's really it. Uh, I hope I gave you some interesting problems here to think about. And again, check the slides for uh, how to actually do the machine learning here. Uh, I think uh, we, can, we can look that up offline. Uh, thanks. Okay, thank you, Dean. So questions? 
these really, um, really distribution. How, how do you even check that a multi multilinear polynomial satisfies a really, really um, criteria? Good question. I, I do. I, do you have an example of one that uh, obviously satisfies this? Um, I do, but I don't think it will help you. This one, <laughs> this one is strongly really, but I don't really know how to to argue that. For, for um, any matrix L? Yeah, so this one does not have, uh, for any matrix L, wow. um, that is an L ensemble. So there's, I guess, some constraints there on like positivity and so on and rank maybe. Um, there are no complex roots of this polynomial that have a positive imaginary part. Yeah. Okay, I'm convinced. <laughs> um, smarter people than me can probably easily tell you why. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, Hank. To study, uh, the output, right? um, that's a good question. Um, so usually when you do this, when you, let's say, take some input, compute a, uh, marginals over other variables, give them as input to the next heuristic model, this actually breaks all tractability. And in fact, in the deep learning world, there are models currently uh, that are very hyped up called uh, state space models, where you essentially do this, you have the type of almost like a Markov chain that you do inference on by essentially multiplying matrices for a long time. You get some output, you feed that in as into the next Markov chain and you do this a hundred times. So, so what you're suggesting is actually being trained right now in the deep learning world to build new language models, but the tractability goes away. You can just sample. Yeah. Yes, yeah, please. So you you saw me on uh, probably six seconds be, being uh, the right tool for neurosymbolic computation for combining neural network and uh, and logical constraints. Uh, is there something hidden? I mean, uh, uh, is, is there a case actually where it is not the right tool for it? Or um, there are some cases where it's not so easy. For example, um, the work that Yujun showed is. Um, saying the distribution has to be a processing circuit and then we can enforce the constraint. So that's fine as long as your constraint has a tractable form. Otherwise you find some over or under approximation. You know how to do that. It gets trickier when your distribution has to be like GPT-24, right? So then you don't have a processing circuit for it and you still would like to enforce constraints. And so there, what we're currently working on is using processing circuits as approximations to blah, blah, blah. So you have to build a bit more complex machinery to then be able to use these ideas to enforce constraints of arbitrary autoregressive models and stuff like that. Yeah. So it gets a bit more complicated. Okay, Reni, maybe let's ask question. So I have a question for earlier uh, by usual. So I think it's uh, five to one sixty or something. So there was a picture of put, putting uh, circuit on top of on top of yeah, this one. Uh, uh, next one. Right, so here you are, so G is the neural network, and then you, you feed it into your circuit. Yeah. Uh, what do you, can you just throw the neural network away and then use, use, only use data to train your circuit? Like, they work. So, so there, this is kind of a, um, a way to, um, so, so the low here in the label, you have like the distribution Q, um, that's conditioned on the function uh, which is G, right? Your, your G is actually defined by the neural network. So this is kind of a, a way to um, do like um, have a conditional version of pieces where it con um, condition comes from uh, a, a neural network. Right? So instead of a single sort of um, distribution over the labels, now now this is depending on some other inputs. And, and you, you vary the input that gets fed in through the, the neural network um, and that changes the distribution over labels. So then you are just kind of pre trained so it kind of becomes a. You, you're training at the same time. Yeah, you're, you're training everything. You don't pre train. So, so technically, you could learn a joint distribution over Y and Z and somehow be that, let, let's say, one circuit. But then usually your, your conditional distribution wouldn't be as good as if you just use a neural network to read Z and spit out the parameters of the pro six circuits. Because if you always know that you're going to observe the inputs of your neural network, there's no need to learn joint distribution over them. You're kind of wasting capacity. 
I hope that's part of your question. Yeah, this is, I guess, yeah, specifically because you care about this conditional distribution and not, not really other queries from the joint distribution. Okay, so let's thank the speakers once again. And before you go, I'd like to remind you that on Thursday, we have the town, town hall meeting. Uh, please join us uh, right after the, the regular program. It's 4.45. And this is when we uh, discuss what we want to do during the, the remaining uh, four months here. Uh, uh, do we want to have reading groups? Do we have to have uh, impromptu talks? Do we have to have what, what do we want to do? What what are the open pro? Uh, anything that relates to the organization of the uh, of the institute of this program, I should say, uh, this is what we're planning to discuss on Thursday. So make sure you're there so you can you can hear your opinion. Okay, we resume tomorrow at the usual time, nine thirty, and uh, coffee nine o'clock.